Is what? Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for Space Shuttle Endeavors STS-134 post-landing crew news conference. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the STS-134 crew and commander. It is uh, Commander Mark Kelly. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming out very early in the morning at 2.30 when we landed if you were there. And thanks for uh, waiting. Uh, sorry it took us so long. We were doing some medical tests and some med medical ex experiments. One of our crew members, Greg Chamatoff, is still in the process of doing that, so he's not going to be able to be with us today. Uh, I'd first like to introduce the rest of my crew. To my left, Greg Johnson, our pilot. Uh, former Air Force Colonel, F-15 pilot. This is his second flight. Second flight on Endeavour and second landing at night. Uh, Mike Fink, U.S. Air Force Colonel as well. Um, Mike is now the U.S. record holder for time in space. He previously did two long duration flights uh, flying up and down on the Russian Soyuz. And then Colonel Roberto Vittori of the Italian Air Force who is uh, with OSI, but on a mission for the European Space Agency. Roberto and I actually have known each other the longest, having served at the Naval Test Center at Patuxent River at the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School uh, probably 15 years ago now. And then Drew Foistel, our lead spacewalker, who led uh, three of the spacewalks during this mission and supervised all four of them. Um, really critical member of this crew. We did four EVAs, which are very, as you many of you know, are very, very high risk things to do. And they went uh, flawlessly. And we got everything done that we planned to do. Um, we installed the alpha, mag alpha magnetic spectrometer on flight day four of the mission, which was a pretty exciting milestone for us. It'll be a new day for astrophysics in space to have a very high-tech cosmic particle detector outside the Earth's atmosphere. Dr. Ting and his team of over 600 scientists and engineers are now really, really busy analyzing 50 million particles a day. I have no idea how they do that. How do you sort through 50 million of anything? But he is uh, managing to do that and hopefully will see some amazing discoveries. Um, but now I guess we'll just take, go around the room and take your questions. Do I get to pick? When the microphone comes away, please say your name and whom you're addressing your question. Um, we have just a few moments, so please limit it to one question at first, if you have more time, we'll come back. And I'll ask it fast. Uh, Commander Kelly, Peter King from CBS News Radio. We'll get this one hopefully out, out of the way. Uh, did you truly say to your wife in your first conversation, I'm back? And how did that first conversation go? How did she sound to you? Well, I haven't spoken to her yet. You haven't? No, because she's probably still sleeping. It's uh, 8.30 in the morning here. <laughs> and, you know, she's in the hospital. And I don't want to wake her up. So I just actually sent her mother an email and said, the first thing I do when I leave this press conference, let me know if she's awake, and then I'm going to call her. <laughs> so. Okay, Marcia. Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press, and I'm sorry to continue uh, on the same thread, but what are you going to tell her, and when, you know, do you think she got up to watch on TV? What, what are you thinking? I don't know. I, you know, one of the reasons we didn't have her come down here is because it was really late in the night, and what she's going through now is a very, you know, physically challenging and difficult thing, very busy schedule. It certainly would be disruptive. We all have kids right now that are just crashed from being up all night. 
And for anybody, you know, just anybody in this room, for us it's, it's kind of easy because we've sleep shifted over a long period of time. But for, you know, you folks that were out at the runway, you're probably pretty tired right now. So uh, what I'm going to say to her, you know, you know that I really miss her and can't wait to get back there t tomorrow to see her. Um, so we're, we're, we're all looking, looking forward to spending time, time with our families. Evan? Uh, Evan Brown, Fox News Radio. Um, Colonel Vittori, um, you're going to be the, or you are the, the last um, non-NASA astronaut to fly on a space shuttle. Um, how important has the shuttle been to the non-NASA space programs, the, the European Space Agency and, and so on and so forth? Shuttle has been a fundamental part of uh, everything that we have done as Europe in space. And uh, we have uh, continuously um, f uh, using the possibility to fly on the shuttle since uh, um, I I don't recall exactly when was the first year but uh, since the very beginning of the shuttle era and obviously for me it's a privilege to be the last one on board of the shuttle on board of Endeavour the flight has been spectacular and uh, I was very pleased to see the space station uh, almost double the size that I had seen in 2005. I was very pleased to see the cupola, uh, node 3, node 2, and everything else that uh, one way or the other went through the European Space Agency and uh, the Italian industry. So I'm very uh, honored and privileged to have uh, this, uh, I've had this opportunity and grateful to NASA. Okay, Mark. Mark Ratterman with Talking Space. A uh, question for Commander Kelly. I first saw you and your crew here at August 26, 2010 at the shuttle landing facility when AMS came over from Geneva, Switzerland. I remember thinking how committed and focused you were on that hot August day. And what do you expect that you will always remember about STS-134's crew and mission? Well, certainly, um, in a 16-day flight, we've got a lot of great stories that we'll be telling for a long time, uh, many w that we certainly can't share with you. <laughs> um, but <laughs> what, what I'll remember most, you know, are these, you know, the four guys here and, and Greg Chamatoff. Um, you know, this is an incredible group. These flights are really, really hard to do. I mean, it's very tiring. Uh, very long days, technically difficult stuff. You know, spacewalks are very hard, the robotic arm operations. I'd say our pilot, Greg Johnson, here is probably one of the most experienced robotic arm operators that the space station has now, even though he hasn't done a long duration flight just from his two missions. Um, you know, this stuff is, 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 is really, really difficult, and to do it with a group of people that are just so accomplished and so experienced and you know it makes it you know very easy for me it makes my job a lot easier to have guys like this uh you know on this crew so i'll i'll, I'll remember them more than anything um todd halverson of florida today i guess for mark kelly um I think you came into the Corps in the mid-1990s, and um, it, it, it's kind of fascinating to me to see how uh, the content in these missions has grown in complexity over the years, and I'm wondering if you can comment on uh, what your perception is on, on how much more complex these missions have become and, and whether or not it's possible, humanly possible, to squeeze any more into a mission than you guys seem to have done this time around? Well, that's a, that's a good question. They have become more complex and, you know, I've, a lot of times you hear crews say, hey, this is the most complex, you know, shuttle mission ever. You, 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 you wouldn't hear that out of me at this point. They're all really hard. So I've never said that. Um, they're really, really difficult to do. They're all completely jam-packed. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, you know, to to address, can you pack more in? Well, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we're going to fly one more flight. It's in six weeks. That flight schedule's been written. It's a crew of four. They're, they're going to have an equally challenging time. Uh, it's on Atlantis. The mission will have to be a little shorter because they can't transfer power from the space station to the space shuttle. Um, so I think, 
y- y- you know, they'll, they'll have a challenging flight, and these are really hard, but they, they, they should be. It's really, really expensive to fly the space shuttle, or any spacecraft for that matter. So the fact that our days, you know, that we are, we wake up and we go to work and we do not stop until we fall asleep is appropriate. You know, it's, it's, it's the way it should be. Fortunately, we're able to do this without, generally, without making mistakes and thankfully without, you know, hurting people, you know, as we go about the day on the space station. Gina. Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Drew and Mike. You both pulled off an eight-hour-plus spacewalk. I mean, that was exhausting for us down here. How was it for you up there on that night? <laughs> it wasn't planned. Um, (laughs) It was exhausting for us as well. Um, I was lucky to have Mike there. Uh, We sort of talked about it pre-flight about what our plans were. We knew EVA 2 was our longest and and, uh, most difficult EVA. Um, It was 2, right, that we went 8 hours? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) It kind of blurred together. Um, And we knew that going into it. So we sort of had a plan that, hey, we're going to stay out here and do what it takes. And also because that was the ammonia day, uh, we knew that we had to, you know, finish the task and uh, see it through to completion. So um, it was tough. I think Mike's going to lose a few fingernails over this. And uh, I certainly have some beat up hands. Um, But we were both, uh, you know, I was was fortunate that that Mark supported us staying out there and getting the job done. Uh, We knew we had a day off ahead of us uh, the next day. And so uh, everything sort of came together. And... um, you know, sometimes uh, looking forward, you don't see the path through to the end. But looking back, I see how um, I, it was almost fortuitous that we had that day off and, and we were able to have uh, EVA 2 land on that day that allowed us to go late. And I'm just happy that we were able to see it through. And, and really, overall, over the four EVAs, uh, we only left one thing out on the table, which was a, a, a cable that we didn't deploy. And um, that's a, a fairly... Um, straightforward tasks that can be left for others to do so so the content was was packed we planned it that way we trained for a year and a half uh, to make sure that we op- optimized every moment of the EVAs and I think uh, you know luckily we were successful in doing that uh, with the teamwork between uh, you know the whole crew uh, the support of the crew and the, and the three spacewalkers so it worked out well I agree with Drew <laughs> 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 me three <laughs> James Dean with Florida Today. I was wondering if any of you guys uh, got to stay up to see that Soyuz depart. Uh, if so, how neat of an experience was that, or, or how uh, eager are you to see that that photo that hopefully will come out uh, with with you guys there, you know, on the outpost, uh, the only time that yeah. that picture with a the shuttle there will ever be seen. If they did, they were not following the commander's orders. <laughs> <laughs> now we were we were we were uh, asleep. Uh, that was our sleep time. It was right in the middle of our sleep time, and and we really didn't have a chance to um, uh, watch it as much as we wanted to. Uh, we just had to get our rest because it was a sprint. The whole mission was a sprint, and we needed our rest. And we're definitely looking forward to that uh, that photo coming out. Uh, we oh, also yeah. took a, a a similar photo uh, through some careful pre-planning, we took a very nice uh, uh, fisheye lens and on our last part of our last EVA, uh, Greg Shamatov uh, was able to sit on top of the world, on top of the space station and look back and we have a couple really nice shots of uh, we can see the end to end of of the space station, the shuttle on one side, the European uh, automated transfer vehicle on the other side, the American segment, the Russian segment, the European, Japanese, and and it is just really a, a stunning picture. And I think Greg said some nice words. So yeah, we got to see that for real. It's not the only picture uh, that's going to see, but I think when Paolo took the, the shots from the Soyuz, they're going to be spectacular. And, and I think we all should be really impressed how big and magnificent that space station is. We saw it on the re rendezvous, on the rendezvous, on the excuse me, undocking, and then the re rendezvous for the storm. And we were just, uh, you know, we're we're kind of older, uh, shall we say, not jaded guys, but you know, we're not easily impressed anymore. We've been there, done that. <laughs> we were impressed. We were excited, like uh, five year olds at a ro- roller coaster park. I mean, it was pretty impressive. Uh, Brian Lock, Stone County leader. Uh, if the shuttle program wasn't winding down, Endeavor did so well uh, with. Uh, no problems. Do you feel that there would be more years left in the shuttles that uh, remain? I want to take that. Well, you know, we made a decision some time ago to retire the space shuttle on this schedule to use, 
to use the you know the NASA budget to build a new vehicle to go on and do exploration to have a you know a simpler safer spacecraft I love the space shuttle I mean I'd fly it you know just probably just like Jerry here I'd fly it as much as I possibly could I'd probably go out there every couple months if I could have the opportunity to fly in the space shuttle but it's uh, 30 years old and you know we can we you know we, we've got to you know grow and adapt and build new things and it's gonna be probably five or six years maybe seven you know before we have a new US spacecraft to take crew members first to and from the International Space Station and then hopefully outside of low Earth orbit but but we'll get there so this was the plan um, but you know personally yeah I would I would love to you know fly the space shuttle every every week if I could Denise Chow at space.com question for Mike Fink um, you're a very experienced space flyer and obviously on this mission set the record um, the new record for the most number of days a US astronaut has been in space um, but this is also your first space shuttle mission I was wondering if you could describe what that experience was like and especially in light of the fact that it was Endeavour's last oh boy yeah um, both myself and uh, Ricky Bobby here Roberto we um, we uh, both flew twice on the Soyuz and that was uh, that was pretty spectacular. It was pretty amazing going through the, the Russian program. And uh, both of us served as flight engineers, got to push a lot of buttons running the checklists in Russian language. And uh, that, was, uh, that was pretty, uh, you know, magnificent, and we definitely treasure that. But uh, getting a chance to fly on the space shuttle, uh, it was a dream of mine, and I couldn't have asked to do it with a better group of, of, of guys here on our crew and a better uh, couldn't have asked for a better ground support team so it was everything I dreamed of when I was that you know eight or nine year old kid that wanted to fly in this new space shuttle thing it wasn't even built yet you know it was and uh, it was still being in the planning and that's all I wanted to do I made a t-shirt with the space shuttle on it with markers because they weren't they weren't out in the stores yet and I still have that t-shirt and uh, and you know childhood dreams don't always come true and sometimes real life comes in but man this dream I mean, the reality was better than the dream. I mean, can you believe that? I mean, it was so incredible. And we just landed a few hours ago, and I'm still just basking in, like, I can't believe it. it was so surreal how wonderful that was. So uh, I'm thankful to my crewmates for supporting me and, and helping helping uh, get through these, uh, these really dif difficult and tough mission. Well, we, got, we got through it and did it really well. It was really amazing. Okay, we have time for one last question with Ken. Uh, Ken Kramer for Spaceflight Magazine. For Drew, uh, you've worked on shuttle missions on both to the Hubble Space Telescope and to the International Space Station. Can you compare and contrast the uh, challenges and the excitement of those very different missions? Uh, well, the Space Station's quite a bit bigger than Hubble, and uh, that's for sure. <laughs> um, you know, the, my, I guess you could, uh, you know, I would talk about the EVA experience, and that was, uh, you know, for Hubble, we parked it in the in the trunk, you know, in the payload bay of the space shuttle, and, uh, and we worked there in close quarters. And um, the feeling of being there working on Hubble, although the tasks were uh, intense and very detailed and, um, and very technical, um, and we did, you know, five spacewalks back to back, that made the schedule very hectic. Um, however, on the space station, um, space station is very large, and there's a lot, you know, long distance to move over. So that that creates, you know, that's a lot of effort in and of itself. Uh, spending that time moving across the space station and doing that work. So um, they're both very challenging, in different ways. Uh, very fatiguing. Uh, any EVA you do, uh, any work that's done outside in a spacesuit is fatiguing. And uh, so to compare them is really just to compare the relative size of the. Uh, of the two spacecraft, you know, the, the satellite versus, the, you know, telescope versus the uh, space station. Um, but the work you know, still wears you out after six or eight hours. The, the feeling's the same when you're coming back in the door. You're sort of sad that it's over, but happy to be done. Yeah. Yeah. This will conclude continuing coverage of the STS-134 mission. For more information on the Space Shuttle program, STS-134, or Space Shuttle Endeavor, please visit www.nasa.gov slash shuttle. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you.